Back on hot stove, uh, John Paul Morosi leads the league in information, uh, JP. So uh, we, we started to talk, and we teased it uh, earlier here. All the focus on D.J. LeMahieu has been with the Yankees. Ah, but could the Mets swoop in there and make Mets fans happy? Very possibly, and our own John Heyman reporting yesterday that the Mets, in fact, have had recent contact with D.J. LeMahieu's camp as his free agency now goes on for the second month. Curious, of course, there's that gap between where the Yankees are and where LeMahieu's request is. I still think around the industry, Fran, the Yankees are viewed as the front runner to sign the reigning AL batting champ. But the Yankees' neighbors in New York, the Mets, also want to upgrade their infield. And when you consider their options out there right now, yes, there's been the talk about Francisco Lindor possibly. But when you consider the alternative here, if the Mets can sign LeMahieu, Maybe then Jeff McNeil moves to third base and your infield includes LeMahieu at second, McNeil at third, and you, you go with Guillaume or Rosario at, at short, and that becomes your group instead of potentially having to trade away McNeil to get Lindor. So you, you think to, to compare them, who would you rather have, LeMahieu, Lindor? Uh, both add a lot of value, of course, in the case of LeMahieu, you'd have him for however long you sign him for, as opposed to Lindor being just the one year, unless, of course, you extend him as part of the deal. So I think Jared Porter, the new GM of the Mets, is, has had a chance now a week or so to, to really uh, get used to the, the overall circumstances of the organization and see where his options are. And LeMahieu with the Mets, I think in many ways fits them as well as he fits the Yankees. The Yankees probably have that hometown, home team advantage, but it does appear right now with that gap between the Yankees and LeMahieu's asking price, LeMahieu is in fact willing to engage with teams like the Blue Jays, like the Mets, if he's not getting what he wants from the Yankees. And Tom, you just talked about uh, Jose Contreras and how the Yankees came <laughs> in and swooped in to get him from the Red Sox. You think there's any way if the Yankees find out that the Mets are seriously entertaining DJ <laughs> LeMayu, they're not going to swoop back in and say, all right, enough of this. You read my mind, Fran. <laughs> I mean, if I'm an agent, yeah, I, I want the Mets in with the Yankees. Blue Jays, yeah, that's great. But having the Mets-Yankees go at it. And if I'm the Mets and I'm Steve Cohen, this also goes back to Yankees-Red Sox. They would bid a lot of times on the same player. It was it Bernie Williams, Mark Teixeira. But in any case, sometimes they just do that to throw a stick of dynamite in the room. You know, make the deal a little more expensive for these other guys, your rivals. And in this case, yeah, they're, they're not the same division, but they're rivals. So it makes a lot of sense from the agent's perspective and even from the Mets. And listen, he's a, JP said this, good fit for the Mets. He's a good fit for every team. Right. He's that good of a player. Right. And, and, and JP, just real quick. So, I mean, loose numbers here. They're, they're looking for best case scenario, like five for, for 125. Is a, Are those the numbers? And I think teams are hoping maybe to, to shorten that to, to maybe four years or three years is – is that kind of where we are? I think you're right, Fran. And, and, and this, to me, is going to be a real telltale contract for where we are right now with this winter time and obviously understanding where revenues are in the game coming off of the COVID-19 season, that, that probably if, if this were a perfect world in terms of revenues being strong as, as they have been, yeah, I think LeMahieu may be able to get a, at least a four-year deal and potentially a five around at that AAV. But I think uh, candidly and realistically where we are right now, I think you're probably right, Fran, that, that a three- or four-year deal is more likely in the current circumstances. And certainly he's, he's a tremendous hitter, batting champion in both leagues. But I, I think if, if his contract comes in at three years, and maybe it's, again, one of the reasons why we haven't seen him sign it yet, is that I think a lot of people in the, in the, on the agent side of this realize that if LeMahieu's deal comes in at three years, it's going to sort of compress mm. everyone else's value too because we know what a great teammate, great player, great defender DJ is coming off a great season with the New York Yankees. That usually means four-year deal plus, and if it comes in at three, it does sort of squeeze the rest of the market for everybody else. So, JP, guys like LeMahieu, we always think there's obviously some advantage in incumbency. We expect them to go back with the team where they've played and been great and great fits, which leads me to Adam Wainwright. Like we just assumed, well, he's going to go back to the Cardinals. Um, maybe not. What do you hear? Well, Tom, it's really interesting because uh, if you had told me at, at the outset that we'd be two days before Christmas and neither Wainwright nor Molina would have signed back with the Cardinals, that's a pretty stunning result in and of itself with where we are right now. But one team that I was told that has interest in Wainwright, the Kansas City Royals. Now, you told a great story about Contreras going back nearly 20 years. 
Well, Adam Wainwright's connection to Dayton Moore, the GM of the Royals, goes back 20 years plus. Adam Wainwright was drafted by the Atlanta Braves 20 years ago. And at that point in time, Dayton Moore was working in, yes, the Atlanta Braves front office. So they have known each other for 20 years, plus the current manager of the Royals, Mike Matheny, who managed Wainwright in St. Louis. So do we expect still Wainwright to go back to the Cardinals? I would say that's still the most likely result. But here we are in the last days of 2020, not knowing where the Cardinals plans are and they've been linked to other players but it's almost impossible for them to move on and, and sign uh, someone like a Marcelo Zuna for example until they know what's going on with Molina and Wainwright and I think from from Wainwright's perspective it would be in the state of Missouri it, it's close enough from, from both a personal relationship standpoint and geographically that you could imagine him taking that leap it would still be hard for Cardinal fans to see Wainwright finish his career in anything but a St. Louis uniform, and certainly their in-state rivals. It's kind of the theme of the segment here with LeMahieu as well. But I, I do think from Adam's perspective, if you're going to leave the Cardinals, it'd be hard to start over totally from scratch with new relationships everywhere. If he signs with the Royals, he would know the GM, he would know the manager. And I think that matters in a case of a pitcher, of course, is the uh, the reigning Roberto Clemente Award winner who's so integrated with his community. I think that's at least close enough that if that's where he goes, there's a little bit of personal comfort level for Adam Wainwright and his family. It's a great point. Uh, the cities are, are very similar. They're just about uh, four hours away. And also, Wainwright uh, does such incredible work with, with young pitchers, and there's so many young pitchers on that Royal staff who could benefit from the knowledge uh, of an Adam Wainwright. That That is... That is going to be something to, to keep our eyes on on because Adam definitely wants to pitch for another year. So uh, we will see how that one uh, shakes out. We heard from Joe Madden, uh, skipper of the Angels, and he had some news about uh, Joe Adele and also Shohei Otane. Uh, what more can you tell us, JP? Yes, Joe Madden telling Maria Torres of the Los Angeles Times that he believes at this point in time that Joe Adele needs some more seasoning at the minor league level. And of course, the talent there off the charts. Uh, he is one of the most talented players, young players in the game. But I think he, he is one player who certainly had a detriment just from the, from the lack of, of minor league at bats and repetitions before he made his debut this year. And I think this, that, that lack of reps uh, coming in before he made his debut in the major leagues may have led to some of the inconsistencies that, inconsistency that we saw from him at the major league level. So I think overall, uh, it's just a question of getting a little bit more of, of a foundation of at bats before he comes in and then has that everyday role. So it sounds like for now, the plan is start him in the minor leagues in 2021, let him get a little more foundation there and then he comes up and he's permanently then a part of the Angels everyday outfield. So we'll see if that means maybe to get a shorter term outfielder at the major league level to help uh, have that intermediate solution there for the Angels at the major league level. And then Shohei Otani, interestingly, Joe Madden uh, telling Maria Torres at the LA Times that he wants to put it in pen that Otani is going to be part of the Angels rotation in 2021. Now he barely pitched at all in 2020 just really a handful of innings and so to get Otani back on the mound for a team that has desperately needed an ace pitcher for a long time would be tremendous for the Angels of course Perry Manassian coming in as the new GM there it would be a really a big help to Perry to be able to count on Otani in those innings but again we had the same conversation earlier about James Paxton and and how many innings can you credibly rely on from Otani it's a really interesting question one of the reasons why even if Otani pitches in the rotation, they probably still need Trevor Bauer or someone like him to really be a contender now in the American League West. And, and, still, and still hit, right? Still hit as a DH? That's the thought, that right, if he can okay. still do both. Now, he was able to, even with, with the, the issue with, his, uh, um, with the injury to his arm this past right. year, he was still hitting. Now, I, I think we will not uh, – the one thing he, we will probably not see him do is play the outfield. So, we right. could probably cross that off the <laughs> options list. He can do it athletically, right. but I think it's putting a little too much on his plate right now. All right, so they're going to continue with uh, the, uh, the two-way experiment. And, by the way, we just got some news in here uh, from, from Jesse Sanchez. Uh, t tell us a little bit more. Yeah, friend, really interesting, and, and thanks for the question. Oscar Colas, uh, similarly to Otani, Colas was a, a two-way player in NPB. Of course, he is a Cuban player, and so he went over initially to Japan to play as a two-way player as part of 
a, a effectively like a loan agreement from his team in Serie Nacional in Cuba. But while he was in Japan, he defected. So it took a period of time where he basically didn't play any games at all in 2020. But he is a tremendous, again, two-way talent, outfielder, pitcher. So Jesse Sanchez reporting just in the last 24 hours, Fran and Tom, that Colas has now been declared a free agent by MLB. Really interesting. Now, he does not, from what I can calculate here, have the requisite amount of years of service to be considered a foreign professional. So he's going to his contract with an MLB team would, would be subject to the international signing allocations and, and the bonus rules that exist in MLB. But he is a really intriguing player and he played uh, not a lot of games there in, in Japan before he defected. So he really hasn't had a whole lot of game activity. But this is a legitimate two way player, uh, similar in some respects to Otani. So all of a sudden here in the, in the midst of a very unique hot stove season, we have a very unique hot stove player in Oscar Colas now being declared a free agent by Major League Baseball. All right.